Hey, welcome or welcome back. Happy Friday. Well, it's been a week, so happy may be an optimistic term, but we have a romance today, a highly anticipated romance that I think will provide a great escape from everything going on and in a lot of ways was written very specifically for this current moment because after all romance is written for the time it is debuting and that is Bombshell by Sarah McLean, the first in her new Hell's Bells series and this is everything we love about McLean as a romance writer and it also has a new charge and bite and thrill to it that is also a little different, which I think is evident in the packaging of the book as well. So this did come as a mass max as I anticipated and the reading experience for this was a lot better than my first mass max, I have to say. I do think that this emulated the reading experience of a trade in a way that is what I thought they were trying to accomplish with the formatting change, but that is not a reflection on the book in any way. That's just how the mass market format is going, so that's not necessarily a reflection on how Avon is packaging this book in particular. What is, however, is this cover that we've got. So we do have elements that we're used to in this in terms of the cover and that we have a heroine in a very dominant position face forward, very much in command on the cover, which is fabulous. But when we get into the font is where we see a little bit of a shift. So Bombshell is the name of the book, one word, really punchy title, and it's in a sans serif font. It is positioning itself from the beginning to be something a lot more cutting, a lot more modern, even in its very lush historical setting. When I saw the cover reveal for this and I saw this sans serif font, I knew that this shift meant something. So this establishes itself within the Sarah McLean universe that we already have for these romances. We are starting with Cecily and Caleb in this book, who we met in the Day of the Duchess. Now, I know I have talked pretty ad nauseum about my inability to kind of remember things between series and sometimes within the series itself as it's being released from year to year. And so that can be a real struggle sometimes, especially with how tightly McLean in particular weaves these. She has a very specific path for these books and they work together very well. They of course stand on their own, but there is a real joy and depth of experience and intertextuality to how she crafts these romance novels. So I was like, okay, because I didn't reread going in. I probably should have because I just think it would have been fun, but I didn't. So here we are. But from the moment I started, I was like, oh, these, these characters, I recognize them. They feel familiar. So I went back to the Day of the Duchess where we do meet Cecily and Caleb. Granted, Cecily is a soiled S, so we get a lot of her during that series, but the Day of the Duchess is where she really shines. And I remember really, really loving Caleb. So I was very excited. And I also think it's a great way to transition readers into this new world with some familiar fan favorite characters because readers have really been wanting this book. We also spend a lot of time in Covent Garden so we get references to the bare knuckle bastards even if we don't see them and I did kind of miss that. I was like oh like I get the sense of them hanging out on the rooftops. I think we get a reference to them like watching over things but I was like oh I miss them. So the prologue of this is kind of different because it establishes Cecily's origin story with this girl gang that is at the heart of this series rather than necessarily her romantic prologue, which we of course have gotten a little bit in the Day of the Duchess, but especially for those readers who are unfamiliar with that story, we're really establishing this girl gang. So she's kind of moving through Covent Gardens and she is a known scandal at this point. She revels in it. She's the wild child, even of the soiled S's. And as she's kind of going on these paths, these performers, keep kind of coming out and saying not this path or not this way and it almost gave me a little bit of like a Caraval the Young Adult series vibe because it kind of had that mythicism and that magic to it as she was finding her place and finding this group that we then get in a ballroom scene as they are up to something very much up to something and it is such a delight to see that transition. We're taken from the kind of darkness of these paths to this kind of glittering ballroom but a kind of glittering ballroom that we haven't seen before because the Duchess of this book, who's known as Duchess, not necessarily always with the thought in front. So we're introduced to this vibrant, 
girl gang as they are in the middle of shenanigans. So we see Cecily as the really vibrant, outgoing, bombshell type. She's the one that will kind of lure you in. And then we have Adelaide, who's a mousy kind of nobody in society's eyes, but she is a thief and she's spunky as well. So she's kind of set up to be a wallflower, but not really. And then we have Imogen, who is just going to set everything on fire. And I'm very excited for her book, which is not next. So we're going to have to wait. But we're kind of teasing that romance a lot in this book. And that's exciting because I know that there's going to be a lot of charge to that. It's almost going to be kind of like when we got to Grace's book in Bare Knuckled Bastards. It feels like there's going to be a lot of lead up to that. And then we have the Duchess, who kind of controls avenues of information and really is the leader of this group. She's the one who kind of put everyone together. So they're in the middle of a plot and it soon becomes evident that they are kind of taking justice into their own hands, especially in relation to the gentry. And they're kind of taking a lord who is a known scoundrel for lack of a harsher word in this moment. And they're kind of turning him into a laughing stock and getting justice for him and helping end a, an engagement that is not wanted or they know will end badly. And of course, Caleb comes across Cecily in the midst of this plot and mucks things up a little bit because they have a history and he's also an American. He's in business with her sister. They own a bar together, her sister and Caleb. And there is a past between Caleb and Cecily, and Caleb has spent most of the last two years back in Boston basically to escape Cecily. Cecily doesn't know that. She thinks she's just been shot down straight, and she's not super happy about that, but also is going to continue to be the vibrant, engaging woman she is, and maybe, like, make him regret it a little bit. But he has been pining hardcore. Like, we remember, we get to see into his head. And there's a lot of pine. McLean loves a tortured hero, and this is no different. In many ways, because I just finished the Wallflower series, this felt like a darker, tighter version of Daisy's story because of, of the way the pining and the oceans and the connections to America and larger things going on. There are secrets in his past that are keeping him in his mind from being with Cecily. And the tortured hero obviously is something McLean does really well. She is able to take these heroes and heroines and circumstances that could easily delve into really frustrating territory because you want to be like, use your words. But these characters have such a deep morality and a strict way of viewing the world that is pretty unbudgeable for large portions of their books that that doesn't feel like an option to them. And the way that McLean is able to craft the tension around that is just unmatched. So we have this really vibrant, fun, funny girl group who are kicking butt and taking names. And they're fighting against a society that is in a huge transition. And in many ways, it feels like it should be a transition for the better because it is the early days of the Victorian reign. And there is a lot of hope in seeing a woman in power, but the realities of that were not what was probably hoped for many women. And we're seeing the kind of pushback from men in society against the idea of women in power and that fear of a woman on the throne and seeing women in power in other spheres of society may trickle down. So there is like a group of thugs basically roving around threatening businesses and places that inherently offer women positions of power or spaces to themselves to operate independently. So we see our women in a bar called The Place that kind of operates in this way. And a bar fight takes place pretty early on. So we get to see the way action is written in this. And McLean's books have always been full of action, but this is a different kind. It feels like our characters here are really rushing in full force into this conflict and this action. Well, the women, the men are like, what are you doing? And now we're here too. I texted my friend who I knew had already finished the book as I was reading and was like, Cecily is Buffy. She is in this fight. She's quippy. She's smart. You can feel those moments where you're like landing a punch and then landing a verbal jab. She's keeping a knife in a leather pocket in her dress. Like there is a real 
fight to her. And then to see her bring the same fight to a tortured hero of sorts who doesn't want to open up and she's going to keep poking him. And that's the kind of energy that keeps things from feeling a little overwrought, right? These tortured heroes are fun, but they need smart, independent women to really match them. Not that other romance heroines aren't by any means, but like that's just the kind of level of energy you have to bring in the book to kind of keep it even keel, to make it feel like it's a fair battlefield. And these women are really fun. We know they can hold their own on their own. We know that they've got each other's backs. Having just finished The Wallflowers, it's it's that same kind of energy, only a little bit more stabby. Although I 100% believe Lillian would stab someone. But that's what they're bringing to the table. And so Cecily is used to this independence at this point. She's been running with these women. She has been on her own. And so when Caleb enters the picture and wants to play like broody, protective hero, she's like, nah, not interested. And that energy then also gets directed at him. But that battle back and forth between the two of them really sparkles and actually leads me to one of my favorite moments in the book, which if you're following along at home is on page 220, and so Cecily is basically like, I'm tired of fighting with you. I would be done fighting with you if I could. I'm over it. And Caleb is like, okay, well, then why? Why? Let's be over it. <laughs> like, let's just stop. And then Cecily says, the battles are how I get a piece of you. And McLean has always been good at this, right? She has these moments that just stand so stark against the backdrop and these really romantic moments that cut and have a language all their own within her books. They don't feel too sappy and they also help balance so that when the novel does go a little sappier, it doesn't feel overwrought. There's always this kind of grounded emotion and darkness to the things going on and yet there's also a real lightness and joy to this novel. There's enough snark and bite to everything that even the most emotionally vulnerable moments, the most that could easily be overwrought if done poorly don't feel corny. They require a deft hand and I think that this novel is a great great example of showing how much skill goes into romances a lot of the time especially in this crafting of both the complex inner inner worlds the personal relationship between Cecily and Caleb and then this larger world that they're standing against and that being built around them. And the way that she's able to continue to kind of travel down these different paths within her own world, because we know all of these other places and characters still exist. We actually get some great cameos from a lot of former heroines at the end. I don't want to spoil that. And I may need to reread the entire backlist to fully appreciate who is showing up there. But we're at this kind of transition moment in a lot of ways, and it mirrors a lot of what we're seeing now. So I've heard McLean talk about how the fashion was changing at the time and how that represented a lot of change in society, as things like that often can. And one of the first scenes in the book is Cecily complaining about the change in fashions to Duchess, is pushing back against the kind of repression we will start to see in the Victorian era. And, you know, not across the board. Obviously, there are levels of nuance, and we will continue to play that out, I'm sure, in this series. But the book immediately establishes discontent with the norm and the way society is pushing forward. And we get that fight against the pushback of society, specifically within the patriarchy, as, as many men in power, especially, are upset and afraid of what the new norm could look like and what that means for their power. So there's a lot of kind of turbulence to the time and the, the larger setting that mirrors a lot, I think, that is going on now. And that's a great way to kind of match the moment and be all the great things historical romance are, right? An escape, as this book really is, especially with how action-packed it is and fast-moving and all of the plots going on, but then also a mirror and a way to explore more modern sensibilities within this other world in a much more eloquent way. Imagine that point being made much better. So you've got all of that going on. And then of course you definitely have some really steamy 
scenes. There is a scene in a cupboard that I will, well, Sturbent's closet. I don't really know what that looks like. As a dramaturg, I could look it up, but I have not. That matches a lot of the energy that I got from a scene in Eloisa James's Say Yes to the Duke that has stayed with me for two years now and is one of the more intimate scenes from romance novels that has actually stuck with me. And then there is one of my personal favorite tropes in that Cecily and Caleb are out outside on Sarah's estate having a heart to heart of sorts, a talk through of things, and it starts to pour rain. And it is November and it is cold, but it's okay because there's a groundskeeper's cottage, don't you worry. So you can imagine. If you know, you know. And if you don't know, you have a way to find out. So there is just so much heart here. We also get to see the friendship between Caleb and Sarah and that relationship continue to be really strong as well as Cecily's relationship with her sisters. We also get to see Caleb's friendship with Sarah continue and still be really strong, which I think is a great juxtaposition of the idea of found family because in many ways Caleb and Sarah are very much a found family. And then we have the Bells. We have the family that Cecily has made for herself. And we get to see her with her sisters as well and the love that is there. But in many ways, it feels like that is almost a mirror so that we can see that these women are very much Cecily's sisters of her heart as well. So there's a lot to talk about with this one. I know I just scratched the surface. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts below as well. Let's chat about Cecily and Caleb and what we're thinking and what we think about what may be coming next. In the meantime, if you feel like it, like, subscribe, stick around, would love to hang out with you more and chat books more. But for now, have a good one, read something good, and yeah, bye.